everyone welcome to the cardiac wire show my name is jake fishman i'm the host of the show and the editor of the cardiac wire and we have a great episode for you all today uh, we're going to be diving into a, a major breakthrough in the treatment of coronary artery disease which is boston scientific's agent drug coded balloon which was approved earlier in 2024 and we have a real expert to talk about this product and this the treatment of coronary artery disease and that's dr Kay kearney uh welcome to the show Thanks, Jake. Happy to be here. It's really good to have you here. Um, maybe just to get us all started off, if you could uh, share some background on yourself, uh, where you work, what your studies have been, uh, your background in treating coronary artery disease, and then also your role in building up the clinical evidence for the agent drug coated balloon. Sure. Yeah, happy to. So I've been at the University of Washington now my sixth year after training, uh, where I did my fellowship there in complex high PCI. So we focus a lot on chronic total occlusions, um, but also a big part of our practice, unfortunately, is instant restenosis because it, it is a pretty big problem. So um, we still have one of the remaining brachytherapy programs using radiation as a strategy to treat ISR. And without a coronary drug-coated balloon on the market, you know, that's really been the mainstay of what we're after. So we kind of have a special interest in this because I think we see patients who really suffer from really recurrent issues and recurrent symptoms and admissions and kind of a lot of fear um, of this hanging over their head after their stunt has failed. So we kind of take a special interest in that and trying to get more durable results for people um, kind of from first implantation and a lot of education efforts around that. Um, as part of that, that helped us, I think, for enrolling in the agent uh, trial, you know, for especially younger patients where we tell them, I'm mostly concerned about keeping options open for them over the years of how to manage their ISR. So sometimes you will restent these lesions, but, you know, we're also thinking about the next 25 years potentially of management and trying to keep them out of the cath lab as much as possible. So with that, you know, for folks, I think the trial was a good opportunity for those who had already had brachytherapy perhaps, or kind of considering that this was available now. And if they did have something, we could do brachy in the future, you know, while waiting for for that to come out. So, so you mentioned how it compares to other treatments already, but I'm I'm curious, maybe we can dive a little bit deeper into that. So, you know, what I've noticed is the agent drug code of balloons um, generated a lot of buzz since its FDA approval. Can you help us just help us understand, you know, why that buzz is has been so strong and um, how the agent drug coded balloon differs from the current treatment options or the, the exist, pre-existing treatment options? Yeah, sure. No, I mean, I think we're really kind of an outlier here in the United States in the fact that we, for all the modern PCI tools we have, we haven't had a coronary drug-coated balloon on the market. So, you know, a lot of us have tried using peripheral balloons off-label, but we just are running out of options for treating some of these vessels. But of course, we're limited by size. They're very difficult to deliver, and it's not actually made to to be there. So um, there's other issues with that. And so really, we just haven't had another option. So Really, I mean, if we look at the way practice has changed in the U.S., really we've been very stunt-heavy for basically everything for quite a while. And I think that's part of why we're seeing this repercussion of about 10% of the cases in NCDR in the U.S. are instant restenosis. Some of that is, of course, like certain patients that have high event rates, but but certainly it's a big, uh, big piece of the mix. So I think that's why, you know, as we're thinking about other ways to keep more options open and get more durable results for patients, that this has become, you know, a big part of the buzz. Of course, in other countries where they've been using this a long time, they're a lot more comfortable, I think, with some of these other ideas of treating de novo disease and um, other issues. But of course, our data here is mostly for instant restenosis, and I think that's the probably biggest play game changer where it gives another option to most facilities because there are only about 40 uh, brachy centers in the United States. So for brachytherapy, radiation treatment, to try to achieve the same thing to solve the biologic activation we cause by repeat intervention uh, without placing a new drug eluding stent. I think that that just expands those options. And even for us, you know, you have to schedule a different appointment with them. So, you know, most people haven't been doing that because of availability and they've just been stenting things until they kind of give up on the vessel and the patient. And I think, you know, this gives us a new option. So looking back since the the launch earlier in 2024, how has the agent chug coat of balloon been embraced in clinical practice? 
Yeah, that's interesting. You know, certainly the economics right now are hard with a new device that we're sort of sorting out, like where it plays into the space. That's probably been the biggest concern at most sites, honestly. Um, I think most people, you know, they have a little bit of, they have some kind of algorithm that sort of helps work through that of, especially patients who represent those we saw in the trial, like multi multiple layers of stenting, or there's a smaller minimal stent area, we're worried about expansion or some other issue, and that it can be successfully treated with one balloon. Of course, that's going to change as this process continues through um, the cycles and we have payment sort of sorted out and, and can, you know, better advocate for that. But I think for all those reasons, at the moment, it's really being used on label in more selective cases. And also people are just getting used to that whole workflow. So it's a pretty straightforward device. It's a balloon, you inflate it, but it does take more steps to be sure you're ready for the balloon to be delivered and to, to lay down the drug. Because once we've performed the DCB inflation, you don't want to go in there and just d disrupt the drug delivery that we've just laid down. So really, we kind of have to be more sure we're done, which is unlike how we approach PCI otherwise. And the way we do that is with imaging. And there's still a lot of folks who are kind of learning how to get feedback. And especially instant restenosis cases are a little bit different ballgame. Um, it doesn't always look as good as when you're putting a new stent in. And so some of those thresholds of like, this looks good. I think now we can proceed with the DCB is important. And really that relies on some comfort with imaging as well. So as we go through that, you know, you sort of are reassessing is a cutting balloon enough. We've got good expansion, good dissections in the new intimal hyperplasia area. If there's new atherosclerosis, that the calcium has been modified and we've got a good result there. And it is a time we typically will also repeat the angiogram, make sure there's no like distal edge issue or something else that we might want to take care of and repeat the imaging. And then you do one long inflation to do the drug transfer. I think that helps both to make sure that we have good drug delivery, but also, you know, that long balloon inflation helps some of these other aspects we run into, like recoil of the tissue and other things that we need to think again uh, about again now that we're doing a pulbert result as opposed to placing a new stent. So you mentioned uh, one aspect about the reimbursement, and I find this aspect to be uh, really interesting. Can you go a little bit deeper into the reimbursement situation for the agent DCB and what's available today? and uh, what the pathway might be towards uh, full reimbursement? Sure. Yeah, it's it's a really, I think, important concept of actually just getting these on the shelf in our cath labs and also how to work that out responsibly and looking forward to the future. So I'm glad you brought that up. I think on one hand, uh, we've all been through this with IVL and sort of shockwave being another disruptive technology that we had to work through to get through this economic issue of how that will work in the lab. And interestingly, like, you know, as a few years into this process now that we're seeing that reimbursement and the way all this is coded has changed a lot. So I would expect there will be something similar. So one important first step is the past year payment will go through for outpatients starting in January. So that basically means that we can still like bill for the device, just like everything else that you're scanning that we use in a case. And so it's not like it's just kind of going out with the bath water. So I think that will be an important first step for labs who are really having a harder time convincing administration to get that on the shelf. That's obviously important. I think we'll have to see where everything goes. All this is always happening simultaneously. I'm kind of learning of how they apply that for the inpatient space. So kind of opposite of what we've seen with IVL, where for inpatients that reimbursement changed, and then we're expecting to see that for outpatients. You know, these, these processes are more complicated and happen separately. So I think what will be important to watch is like how it gets coded ultimately. And some of that is assigned to what's the work that's going into these. So if the, you know, if the CMS looks at this and it's basically a balloon that just gets added on at the end, that's not really going to justify a higher cost profile or reimbursement level, but sort of all the other gear that goes with that. Um, so I think to your point about patient selection, you know, sometimes it's like, well, this is a particularly bad one we're having to use a lot of equipment to like get a better result and we want to capture that. So we've done atherectomy, we've used other gear to kind of get to this point. We're more invested in trying to make, we believe that they're more vulnerable to that biological uh, activation. We're probably going to use it there. Um, but on the flip side, like you also, have, your coders are going to add in atherectomy and this other stuff that you um, that you did in addition to the, the POBA billing that we're getting. So at the end of the day, you know, we're there to treat patients, but I think that is a limitation of just using it for fun in these kind of newer and exciting areas that are less data-driven. Um, so at the moment, that's really, I think, appropriately keeping us on label um, as we look for more data from our colleagues who have been using these a lot longer. 
Uh, you shared some really interesting insights about basically how you select the patients who are uh, candidates, the patients with ISR are candidates for the agent drug coated balloon. Are there certain types of patients or patient characteristics that you would look for uh, as an uh, agent DCB treatment candidate? Yeah, sure. I think there, the times that you might consider repeat stenting still are often single layer. It's a large vessel, and there might be a lot of neoatherosclerosis or other aspects there that to modify that and actually get a good lumen area. Um, a second layer stent is very reasonable. And again, you're sort of getting all that feedback from imaging. But certainly if there's two or more layers, for sure, and sometimes that's just areas of overlap or spots that are really not well expanded and we're struggling to do that, again, typically that's because it's already two layers and there's a fibrotic layer there that makes that uh, more challenging for even all the tools we have to get good modification at that point. So in those cases, um, if there's like a true stent problem, you know, this this is also one where adding a second layer will only detract from our options. It won't necessarily add anything. I think this is, you know, the safety profile is good and it does, you know, based off the data, limit the number of patients who have to come back. I mean, right now we have one year data, but if we look at that from the true new intimal hyperplasia cycle, what we see with brachytherapy is, um, you know, if you can get patients past that year, we actually do pretty well because that new intimal hyperplasia is really peaking in that six to like three to nine months period. So if we get past a year, you know, patients do start to breathe a little sigh of relief because we often see that those rates are now better. So they can still have new problems come up, but at least that kind of vicious cycle of where they get hyperplasia and they're back in the cath lab and everyone's frustrated and their primary team doesn't even want to cath it anymore, like that kind of really bad cycle, um, we can finally break with that. Seems like a really valuable um, option for those patients. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that you were an investigator in the agent IDE trial. For the folks who are watching and maybe uh, aren't familiar with the results of that, can you share some of the, the key results and takeaways from the agent IDE? Yeah, I think there's a few specific things. So one, imaging rates were high, so I think you can't really extrapolate that. It, it wasn't perfect, but I think some of those cases, maybe it wasn't actually the core lab didn't get the images, but hopefully they were done. There's a few instances of that or where it was difficult delivery because of issues with the stent and maybe their setup. So I think um, when you go into these cases, you have to have a commitment to imaging to get those same results because that was very high in the trial. But second was we, it was a two to one design. So that helped us with enrollment. So for every two patients who got the drug coated balloon, only one had standard POBA with an NC balloon, other devices that were still open, but the final you know, kind of randomized uh, point of the trial was that was an NC balloon uh, in comparison. So overall, because of that, more patients were getting the new device. They were more willing to be engaged. So we actually enrolled very quickly, uh, which was encouraging given this was kind of during the COVID oh. pandemic and the aftermath of that. So that certainly helped. And then what we saw is there was basically 50% reduction in patients coming back about one year with target lesion failure as a composite endpoint. And I think, you know, what we learned from that is that some of those cases are not benign. It also reduced MI, so that was important. Um, and also, even in the agent arm, 18% of patients still came back with heart condition failure. So it's still a very high-risk group, but that's a lot better than, you know, double that effectively. So overall, you know, the it shows a lot of improvement, but I think it also emphasizes that we have to do a good job the first time around. And we're probably still learning of, like, what result is good enough in ISR in some of these cases with mixed disease. So there may be new calcific disease and some new intimal hyperplasia response and separating all that out. And the, the patients where we tended to see the most benefit were, um, you know, in clinical practice, I think we're represented here in terms of multiple layers was like 40 uh, to 45 percent of patients had that, you know, they were higher risk. They had multivessel disease. Um, so, you know, they they certainly were up there. Um, and the safety profile was good. You know, we didn't see any cases of instant thrombosis. I think that's kind of just in people's minds where we're bringing paclitaxel back to a market where we didn't, we don't use that on stents for a reason. Um, but in here, in, you know, it's easier drug delivery and performs well to kind of hit that hard in the beginning. And, you know, a lot of patients in, that we experienced in the trial did have to stop their DAPT at some point within that year. And, you know, at least so far that that seems to be safe. Um, and so I think overall it, that just was encouraging that it's at least additive to the other work we're doing and that we still have work to understand of like, how do we get the best results for these patients coming out of it? So at TCT, uh, we saw a some subgroup analyses from the Asian IDE trial. Uh, I believe one was 
minorities uh, compared to whites in outcomes. Uh, one was women ver uh, compared to men, and one was large vessels and small vessels. What are some of the insights that came away from from those analyses? Yeah, I think overall it seems encouraging that we're not finding, you know, that overall that these are seem to be fairly generalizable results. I think one of the issues is, you know, look using sex specific outcomes as an example is most trials including this one still have a lower percentage of the subjects enrolled are women. So we're always hitting that kind of 20 25% range um, which was true here too. So I think we have to be a little bit careful about extrapolating, you know, all of these as hard endpoints but at the same time, there are sub-analyses after all, but at the same time, um, you know, that's pretty typical of the populations that we're seeing in most trials, and that's what we can get. And what we also worry about is that overlap, like, well, why would women have a different result? It might be due to vessel size or the initial PCI result, because we know that in other studies, they haven't always had the same outcomes. So overall, I think that's encouraging, but we still probably need to look for other, some of these other groups, we might actually learn more um, from real world, world registries and things like that too. But overall, I mean, I think the physics and the biology seems to play out in a large swath of people. Um, I think the small vessel disease is something that we're, uh, the smaller vessels is something that we'll want to get more and more imaging data. So it's probably one of the strengths of the study is using that. Um, there has been some conflicting stuff coming out from various other um, studies looking at DCV, but not all with agent. So one question, is it a class effect or are there differences between balloons? And the second is, how does that apply? And is probably different in de novo disease, of course, versus small vessels treated for ISR. Um, but again, I think overall, there's some practical points there about what is the minimal stent area we can get and what's a good option for the patient now that keeps other options open later. So I think while all that's interesting, I think the real bang for the buck is just that, you know, it seems to be a safe alternative. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned just now a couple areas where it would be interesting to see uh, more research into the, the agent tricoded balloon. Uh, just overall, is there certain research areas you think that would be important to address as we continue to understand the agent DCB's impact? Yeah, I think one that people are really interested in and get a lot of questions about here is in treating bifurcation disease that, you know, it's not quite the same as ISR, but when you do have you're trying a provisional strategy and we have side branch compromise and we want to balloon that, like, is this additive? And there's probably some cases where it's black shift. Once you improve the flow, it's going to be fine no matter what you do. Um, but certainly there's cases where there's a little plaque there. We have to do more modification and that can be more activating to cause target lesion failure without stenting, which is always what we, that's the main difference we see in one versus two stent strategies in those cases. So um, I think that's where there's going to be a lot of attention coming up here. And then in the instant restenosis, you know, I, I really think that trying to better understand imaging endpoints that help guide us to get better outcomes is going to be the next key piece. Yeah. Dr. Kearney, thank you so much for sharing all your insights. It's been uh, really interesting and it's, I'm excited to see how uh, Agent DCB continues to evolve and the impact that it has. Uh, for the folks who are watching, I'm sure you learned a thing or two about Boston Scientific's Agent Drug Code of and the work that the Dr. Carney is doing. Thanks for joining us and we'll catch you next time.